talking about the oneness of God, the apostolic oneness, how that God is one. And he was uh, in the beginning spirit, and he took upon himself the form of flesh. And we knew that flesh, or beheld that flesh, as the only begotten Son of the Father. And then when he left this earth, became spirit again in a comforting manner as a Holy Ghost. And one of these days, God's going to show the world that his name's one and that he's one that God may be all in all and everything. What we want to talk about this week is the truth about water baptism. The truth about water baptism. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 28 and beginning with verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Then in Mark chapter 16 through verse 16 through 18. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Then Luke chapter 24, verses 47 through 49. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until... Ye be endued with power from on high. John chapter 20, verses 21 through 23. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit. They are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 and 39. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Galatians 1 and verse 9, As we said before, so say I now again, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. Because there is only one gospel, and that one gospel tells us that we must be baptized in the name of Jesus. Men have been so absorbed in their ancestral views concerning water baptism that the Holy Ghost has a very difficult task in bringing them to a knowledge of the truth. So engrossed have they been in their traditional doctrine that the great majority has rejected the commandments of God 
and made the word of God none effect through the traditions that was delivered unto them. Jesus said in Mark 7 verses 5 through 13. Now the text in the Bible that forms the foundation upon which the Trinity is built is also their baptismal formula. Tradition prevents men from baptizing believers in the correct manner because of a strong link between their Godhead theory and water baptism. The entire structure of the Trinitarian doctrine would crumble to the ground if converts were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For then it would be apparent that the name of the Father and the name of the Son and the name of the Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. To support the theory of three persons in the Godhead, Trinitarians tend to or demand that everyone must be baptized according to Matthew 28, 19, where it was spoken, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. What are the excuses used for this erroneous form of baptism? Some say, I would rather obey the words of Jesus than those of Peter. Others consider it important to include the Father and the Holy Ghost in the baptismal wording so that they will not be offended. A third reason is that to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ would identify them with what is considered as the Jesus-only people who supposedly deny the Father and the Holy Ghost, but in reality they make Him manifest to all the world. Are these very valid reasons? I would not really say so. Could a person be wholly justified for failure to comply with many other scriptures on the basis of these three excuses? I would sincerely doubt it. But let's see what really the Word of God says. What does the Bible have to say? Because when it comes to the Word of God, it does not really matter what you and I say. But it really matters what thus saith the Word of the Lord. Because if you and I cannot back up what we believe, if we cannot back up what we teach with the Word of God, then we have no business teaching that or any other doctrine. If you can't back it up with God's Word 100%, then you have no reason and no uh, authority wherewith to teach something from the Word. Before we can ever pick out a single verse of Scripture and declare it to be exclusive, the exclusive command of Jesus on a particular subject, then we must first remember that all of His words are in all four Gospels. It, not, it is not just in one of the Gospels, but it's in all four of the Gospels. And, and we must obey all of His words that are recorded in these four Gospels. To find the meaning of Matthew 28 in verse 19, the commission of our Lord as recorded in Mark, as recorded in Luke, and as recorded in John must also be examined. You cannot examine the Great Commission only in the light of Matthew, but you must exa examine it in the light of the other three books as well. The same meaning was practiced in the book of Acts, and it was preached in the epistles. Four major reasons are given for not using Matthew 28, 19 as an exact baptismal formula. One of those reasons is historical evidence. All encyclopedias and church history books declare that as long as the apostles were alive, there was no other formula other than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that was ever used in water baptism. No genuine first century book records a single incident where any other formula was ever used in the first 100 years of the Christian era. It's generally admitted that the book of Matthew was not even written 
until around 62 AD where the half a million converts that were baptized prior to the writing of Matthew that were baptized in Jesus' name between the day of Pentecost and the time of Matthew's writing, were they all baptized wrong? I doubt that very seriously. What did Matthew leave out that the other four authors did not leave out? Or the four other four Gospels included? One of the things that he left out was faith. This is not mentioned. Mark said, he that believeth or has faith and is baptized shall be saved. Faith in God must precede repentance. In fact, the Bible declares that without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must first believe that He is. And not only that He is, but that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. The second thing that Matthew left out was repentance. Matthew did not say anything about repentance. But Luke recorded that repentance should be preached. Uh, and it shouldn't just be preached any old way. But it should be preached in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Luke 24 verse 47. Matthew also left out remission of sins. Not one word was spoken by Matthew about our sins being remitted. But yet John said, Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. How could John say that? The majority of these believers were saved through Peter's and Paul's preaching. Did Matthew teach something different than these two great apostles? No, he did not. Another reason that we ought not use Matthew 28, 19 as a baptismal formula is because of the words of the apostles. We must remember that Jesus did not write any of the New Testament books. We must depend entirely upon the word of his apostles in order to know what he actually said and what he actually taught. Jesus stated this, that we should believe on him through the word of the apostles. John 17 and verse 20. Would anyone dare say that uh, these men were baptized wrong and that Jesus' command was not literally followed or fulfilled? This would imply that the inspiration given when Christ breathed on them was useless. The Savior's personal instruction for 40 days was wasted and the statement that the Lord opened their understanding that they might understand all the scriptures was really of no effect whatsoever. It would charge that Christ with no discernment in choosing his disciples. He didn't really know if they could not be trusted in carrying out his orders. Had they made such a tragic mistake in obeying his command, could we safely trust any of their other teachings concerning the Christian life? But I know that they didn't make an error because they very much fulfilled what Jesus said for them to fulfill. Another reason for not using the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in baptism is that there is no scriptural incident whatsoever. Not one person in the early church was baptized in any other formula other than in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. A quick glance at the Acts of the Apostles or what the Apostles did we find that it indicates three instances of the use of the name of Jesus in baptism. But when you and I examine it a little more thoroughly, we find that there are actually nine instances that are revealed. One, the Jews on the day of Pentecost were baptized in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. The Samaritans were baptized in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 8 verses 12 and verse 16. 
Paul was uh, uh, baptized when he was when he was seeking to bind those that called upon the name of Jesus. Acts nine and verse fourteen. The Lord appeared to Paul and informed him that his name was Jesus. First of all, Acts chapter nine and verse five, and that he must bear that name. Acts chapter nine and verse sixteen. And Paul was baptized in the name of Jesus. And this evidence is found in Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. And Acts chapter 22 and verse uh, uh, 16. We know that the Gentiles in Cornelius' household were baptized in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 10 and verse 48. The believers at Rome were baptized in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 6 verses 3 through 5. The Corinthians were baptized in Jesus' name. Paul even made the statement, Was you, were you baptized in my name? Were you baptized in the name of Apollos? Were you baptized in the name of Peter? No. You were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 12 through 13 and chapter 6 verses 9 through 11. The Galatians were baptized in Jesus' name according to Galatians 3 and verse 27. Even the Ephesian believers or the church at Ephesus were re-baptized in the name of Jesus. Uh, Acts chapter 19 and verse 5. The Colossians were also baptized in the name of Jesus. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12. So it shows that there is much scriptural evidence for baptizing in the name of Jesus, but none whatsoever for baptizing in the titles of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. To fulfill the words of Christ, you and I must find a scriptural incident to illustrate what he really meant. Jesus said that they shall take up serpents, but we know that when we look at this, uh, we know that this ver we have to look at the other verses around it uh, to really find the meaning of this verse. And the meaning of this verse is found in Acts chapter 28, verses 3 through 6, where Paul, unawares, unawares, was picking up sticks and a serpent latched upon his hand and no harm came to him. Why? Because he was full of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost protected him. No, that doesn't mean that you and I would go out and begin to foolishly tempt God. Because we cannot afford to tempt God and not pay the consequences. Another reason or the fourth reason why we should not use Matthew 28, 19 as the baptismal formula is because it was an incomplete command. The Great Commission is recorded in all four Gospels in the and in the book of Acts. For 40 days, the Lord discussed this Great Commission with His disciples. Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. The first mention or, or recorded words was found in Mark chapter 16, verses 14 through 18. And then in John chapter 20, verses 19 to, through 23. Both of these incidences occurred... In Jerusalem, on the eve of Jesus' resurrection, while the disciples sat there at meat. The second recorded is uh, in Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. And it took place on the mountain in Galilee. The third took place just prior to his ascension from the Mount of Olives. And it was found in Luke chapter 24, verses 45 through 51 and Acts chapter 1 through uh, chapter 1 6 through 9 when Matthew recorded the great commission he mentioned this that they should first of all teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost Matthew 28:19 Mark added to that and said he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned and these signs shall follow them that believe and then he proceeded to list the different and various signs that would follow the true believer. For you and I just to say, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, does not really mean that we are a believer. Because if we are a believer, then Mark said, these signs shall follow them that believe. 
He also said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Why? Because if you don't believe, you surely will not be baptized in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. But we must be baptized in His name. Luke mentioned that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name. Whose name? In the name of Jesus. Among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And then He continued on and said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Luke 24, verses 47 through 49. John described it like this. He said, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. John 20, verses 22 through 23. The book of Acts was also written by Luke. And Luke stated, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Acts 1 and verse 8. Let's see just how consistent the apostle Peter was with his message on the day of Pentecost, and the great commission that was given by the Lord Jesus. He was supported now by all of the other apostles. We must, uh, uh, we must uh, acknowledge that and realize that because the Bible says Peter stood up and the eleven with him. Every one of them stood up with him. Every one of them attested that what he was saying was the truth. Every one of them believed beyond a shadow of doubt that what Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost was the salvation message, was the keys to the kingdom of heaven that God had given him in the beginning when he said, Upon this rock I'm going to build my church, hallelujah, and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And he's doing that today. He's still building the church. And I don't care what kind of gates of hell begins to try to prevail against the church. They'll never prevail against the church. Nor will they ever bring the name of Jesus out of God's word. Or out of the salvation plan or the salvation message. Every one of them supported him. Including Matthew. Acts chapter 2 and 14 and verse 37. He said, repent, number one. He said, number two, he said, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Uh, part three, he said, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and your children and all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. What did Jesus say? Because many say, I would rather follow the words of Jesus or obey Jesus than Peter. Well, let's see what Jesus said. Jesus said in Luke 24, verses 47 through 49, He said this. He said, first of all, that they should preach, number one, repentance. Number two, remission of sins in His name. Who's name? In the name of Jesus. And number three, he said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Were Luke and Peter contradicting Matthew, or were they all in agreement? I maintain that they were all in complete 100% agreement because Peter fulfilled exactly what Jesus said. When Jesus said, Repentance, shall be preached. Uh, Peter said, you've got to repent. Uh, hallelujah. When he said, remission of sins uh, shall be preached in my name, beginning in Jerusalem. Uh, at Jerusalem, Peter said, uh, and you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ uh, for the remission of your sins. And the third thing, he said, I will send the promise of my Father upon you. And Peter said, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for this promise, hallelujah, is unto you and to your children and all that are far off. Hallelujah. They were in total and complete, perfect 
harmony. Matthew's account was only a broad general statement which did not include several important points uh, that was included by other writers. He did not intend that we should repeat the words of the commission, but he intended for us to carry out the orders. Hallelujah. If you weren't baptized in Jesus' name, how could men hate you for his name's sake? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who are the Jesus' name people? It's those that have been baptized in the name of Jesus. The apostles and the disciples in the first church were hated. They were not only hated, but they were despised because of the name of Jesus. And if you bear the name in this world today, you will be hated and you will be despised because of his name. It was not for speaking in other tongues. It was not for miracles. It was not for healing or good works that they were hated, but they were hated because of his name. Hallelujah. Because of the devil's hatred of the name of Jesus. He will again in these last days put it in the hearts of men to persecute, to afflict, and to kill those that love the name. Hallelujah. At this very moment, the forces of hell is working against the advocates of the name of Jesus. Baptism in order to try and silence their mouths. But I want you to know that they're not going to be able to stop the name. Hallelujah. The ecumenical movement is composed of those that cling to the doctrine of the Trinity. If there's ever been a, a if there's never been a love for the truth in your heart, you had better pray for that kind of love because persecution is on its way for all who hold the truth about water baptism in the name of Jesus and the oneness of the Godhead. Praise the Lord. He said, you will be hated of all men for my name's sake. The name that's above every name. The name that every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess. That he is Lord. Hallelujah. He is the only Jehovah God. He is the only one. That all the nations will acknowledge one of these days. But I want to acknowledge him now. I want to take upon his saving name now. Don't you? Hallelujah. I want to be baptized in Jesus name. I want to bear the name that's above every name. I want to lift that name up because the Bible declares that if you and I lift him up, if we lift up the name of Jesus, all men are going to be drawn into him. Why? Because that's the only saving name. He said, your name is a strong and a mighty tower. Hallelujah. And we can flee unto it for safety. Oh, how we need to lift up the name of Jesus. And that's the truth about water baptism is lifting up the name of Jesus, being buried in his name for the remission of your sins. Let's stand. Hallelujah. How could John say that? How could John give men the authority to remit sins? Praise the Lord. I'll tell you how. Because when you baptize somebody in the name of Jesus Christ, then those sins are remitted. But if they are not baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, then those sins are retained unto them. So it, it, it is inevitable that you and I must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ or we are still in our sins. And if we're still in our sins, then we will die in those sins. And be raised in those sins. And we know the destruction of those that are sinners and ungodly. That do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, or Paul uh, said, that Jesus will come back in flaming fire. Taking vengeance on all them that know not him. Or know not God and obey not the gospel. Praise the Lord. It did not uh, even talk about receiving the Holy Ghost in Matthew. He did not even record that whatsoever. But Luke did not forget it. 
He said, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And he picked right up from there. That was in Luke 24, 49. He picked right up where he left off in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. He said, And ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Judea, in Jerusalem, all of Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Matthew did not mention signs following. There was nothing said about them. But yet Mark said, And these signs shall follow them that believe. My name. Whose name? In the name of Jesus. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Mark 16, verses 17 through 18. It was also left out the name. Matthew did not even tell us what the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost is. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the name of the Son is Jesus. We know that he also said in John, he said, I come in my Father's name and you do not receive me or you don't believe me. But he said, you let somebody else come along in their own name and he said, you'll receive them. If he came in his Father's name and he didn't come in his own, then his Father's name had to be Jesus. John 5 and verse 43. Praise the Lord. And Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless because I will come to you. And he said, this comforter of the Holy Ghost will come in. In verse 19, you'll notice it says name singular, N-A-M-E. So there must be one name that fits all. And we find most assuredly that that name is Jesus Christ. The name of the Lord Jesus. A very significant fact was mentioned by Matthew. He said we must teach all nations that all power, that is all authority in the original Greek, had been given to him, Jesus, in heaven and in earth. And if all power was given to Jesus in heaven and in earth, then if there were such a thing as a trinity, then the other two would not have any power whatsoever. But I'm glad that there's not a trinity. I'm glad there's only one. And I'm glad that his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Matthew 28 and verse 18. All who accept the teaching concerning Christ's authority are to be baptized into a name, one name. And that name is to be the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit of the Holy Ghost, and that name is Jesus. Praise the Lord. Regardless of the differences in beliefs concerning the Godhead, everyone should acknowledge that the Father and could give all authority in heaven and earth to the Son. Such a transaction would automatically transform the name of the Lord Jesus Christ into a name representing all the authority of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. This should be uh, easily discerned by any sincere person. What Matthew was depicting was far from being contradictory to any of the other three writers. He, had, he has in reality declared a beautiful truth, which is an essential part of the gospel message. All the apostles interpreted Matthew's wording perfectly, and they put it into action when they baptized the converts in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. What is the importance of a name? You have some that get so upset. In fact, Trinitarians feel that oneness people place too far too much emphasis on the name of Jesus. Why should it matter whether the, uh, whether the name is used or whether the phrase is used? What really matter. Some people even go so far as say that it's only a matter of semantics, but I want you to know that it's a by far greater matter than just semantics. Uh, the scriptures give a clear answer on this issue. Why you and I ought to exalt the name of Jesus. Why the name of Jesus is so important. One of the reasons is because it is a powerful name. The name of Jesus is powerful enough to communicate 
salvation to even the basest of sinners. Uh, neither is there salvation in any other. Uh, there is, for there is none other name given under heaven, given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other name that you and I can be saved by than the name of Jesus, Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. This verse harmonizes with the message given Joseph by an angel concerning the child to be born. And it said this in Matthew 1 and verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. Paul heartily endorsed the power invested in the name. When he said, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things that are in heaven, of things that are in earth, of things that are under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11, and Ephesians 1, verses 21 through 23. The second reason for the name of Jesus being so important is because it is the name in birth and marriage. As the Son of God, Jesus hath by an inheritance inherited a more excellent name. Hebrews 1 and 4. What name did Jesus inherit? He inherited the Father's name. Every son inherits his Father's name. A man's name indicates whose blood he is in his veins and it gives him the right to bear the name of his earthly father and as we have borne the image of the earthly we shall also bear the image of the heavenly first corinthians 15 and verse 49 when we are born again we are born again not of corruptible seed hallelujah first peter 1 and 23 and john 3 and 5 and we are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Ephesians 2 and 13. Why shouldn't we bear the name of our heavenly Father also? Baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ identifies you and I with the heavenly Father. While individually we are His children, collectively we are His bride. And this is what it said in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. Every bride is glad to take upon her husband's name, which is also the name of her husband's father. Whose name are you taking on today? You must take on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, or we cannot even begin to be a part of the bride of Christ. The third reason that there is importance placed on the name of Jesus is because it is the name of God. Jesus said, I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. John 5, 43. Again he repented, uh, repeated unto them, I have manifested thy name unto the, the men which thou gavest me. John 17 and 6. Holy Father, keep them in thy name. The name that thou hast given me. Hallelujah. John 17 and verse 11. Why? Because there's only one name. Praise the Lord. And one of these days uh, that name's going to be manifested to all the world. And the name is Jesus. In the Old Testament God revealed himself under various names. Such as El and Elohim and Eloah and Adonai and Elion and Shaddai. That's just a few, but there is only one name. There is one name in the Old Testament uh, known as the name. The name. This name, Jehovah, is used more than twice as many times as all the other names or divine names combined. The Jews considered this name so sacred uh, that they were afraid even to pronounce it. Uh, for this reason, Jehovah was generally, though improperly translated by the Lord, this unutterable name was abbreviated as J-A-H, and it was incorporated in a lot of personal names, such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, and many others. 
The Israelites were commanded to fear this glorious and fearful name. Deuteronomy 28 verses 58 and 59. Never forget this name. They were admonished in Jeremiah 23 verses 25 to 27. And Psalm 44 verses 20 to 21. And to make mention that his name be exalted in Isaiah 12 and verse 4. When the fullness of time was come for God to reveal himself one last time. Not to one nation but to a dying world. He proclaimed his one supreme name by the use of the wonderful name of Jesus, which literally means Jehovah the Savior. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad I know who Jesus is, aren't you? Praise the Lord. Jesus is the Greek form of a Hebrew name, Jehoshua, or Joshua. When it's transferred into the Greek, it assumed the form Jesus. Moses changed the name Oshea, the son of Nun, to Jehoshua or Joshua. Numbers 13 and verse 16. His name meant Savior. That is, Hosea did that in its original form, which he was to the nation of Israel. Being a prophet, Moses recognized him as a type of the Savior. Praise the Lord. He recognized that. And because of that, he added to Hosea's name, Jah. Praise the Lord. Making his name Jehoshua or Joshua. Why? So that it could be that covenant name. That name that would be above every name. That name that would be the one that would lead the people and save the people. Hallelujah. And many years later, our Savior which is Christ the Lord, Luke 2 and verse 11, was born and named Jesus, which is Jehovah's Savior. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 43 and verse 11, uh, verses 10 and 11, He said, I want you to know me. I want you to understand that I am He. Before me there was no God for me, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord. And beside me there is no Savior. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You've got to realize that there's only one Savior. And that one Savior is Jesus Christ. And Him crucified. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The fourth reason that the name is so important. Is because the name of Jesus will bring persecution. The devil hates the name of Jesus. Why do you think people fight Jesus' name, baptism so heartily? Because Satan does not want them to be baptized in that saving name. He doesn't want you to acknowledge him as Lord and Savior. He doesn't want you to inherit eternal life. So therefore he tries and attacks the name of Jesus. Because of his attacks the apostles hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 15 verse 26. The rulers commanded the apostles not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. Acts 4 and verse 18. They didn't care about the Holy Ghost. They didn't care about the miracles. They didn't care about anything else. They just did not want them to preach in the name of Jesus. So they beat them. Later they called them back in. And they said, Did we not straightly command you that ye should not teach in his name? Hallelujah. Acts chapter 5 and verse 28. You talk about getting the devil upset. You begin to proclaim the name of Jesus as the only eternally saving name that God ever take, took upon himself. Praise the Lord. When he was born, he said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? Because he's going to save his people from their sins. Hallelujah. How could anyone be hated of all men for his name's sake? Luke 21 verse 17. If they were not called by his name.
to you about this evening is uh, Sabbath keepers. So you can pretty much determine from the title of that that I want to talk about the Sabbath and what the Scripture has to say concerning that. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 15, it says, And remember that thou was a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore, because of this, the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. Moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not uh, one jot, one jot or one tilt, tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And what he was talking about when he said one jot and one tittle, he was talking about the different, if you've not seen the Hebrew language you, or the Greek language, you, you would not understand that. But there's uh, dots and there's, uh, which they call jots, and there's tittles which are different various uh, marks in the Hebrew language because there's no vowel. And he was telling there's not even going to be a hyphen, if you want to put it in our terminology. There's not even going to be a comma that's missing until all be fulfilled. Then in Galatians chapter 3, verse 25, But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Verse 26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. He, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 and 8 and verse 13. For if the, that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. In verse 13, in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon are of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until mid midnight. We talk about a long-winded preacher. He preached from that morning till midnight. And I believe it was the same sermon that one man fell asleep. So see, even the greatest of all preachers had someone fall asleep on him once in a while. Except the sad situation is that man fell and broke his neck. But thanks to the, uh, they thank God and through the power of God that he was restored. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. In other words, he was saying, on the first day of the week, lay up in store an offering, as God has prospered you, so that you may give it. And he said, I won't have to take up offerings when I get here. Then in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, 
And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And that the Lord thy God brought thee out of thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore, because that God brought you out, because you were a servant to the land of Egypt, and God brought you out. Then he said, The Lord thy God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Deuteronomy 5 verse 15. They had been slaves under Egypt and under Pharaoh for many years, and now they were given an, actually a day of rest by the Lord. The fourth commandment, according to Exodus 20 verse 8, said, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And that is actually pointing back to the day when Moses had told the people to rest on the Sabbath day and not to gather any manna on that day. Who was supposed to keep the Sabbath day? Wherefore, the children of Israel. In the middle of the 19th century, there was an angelic visitor was said to have announced that a new doctrine was to be established, and that doctrine was the keeping of the Sabbath, or Saturday as a Sabbath, and that the Ten Commandments are binding today. And the Fourth Commandment was actually the most to be observed, or the keeping of the Sabbath, was to be honored even more than all. And these were none other known as the Seventh-day Adventists. Some call them... Uh, uh, followers of Armstrong or Armstrongism because of Garner Ted Armstrong and Herbert W., his father, who began this. Now, this particular church organization called the Worldwide Church of God was named the Seventh day Adventists, and it's actually one of the fastest growing denominations today. Their most important message to the, their followers is that. Christians are to observe Saturday instead of Sunday as a day of worship. And they've got some reasoning behind what they're saying. Their doctrine is based upon, number one, Old Testament teaching. The Sabbath is the oldest religious institution in the world, according to Genesis 2 and verse 2 and 3. It was given at creation before sin entered and was renewed by Moses in the Ten Commandments according to Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 through 11. It was a day that was made holy by God. And this seventh day was a day that was blessed by God. And so they say it was that day and not the first day. And this particular day was sanctified and set apart for holy use. There is only one day that we can keep holy, and that is the one God has made holy, or so say the Seventh-day Adventists. This original Sabbath was uh, to be observed even after the restoration of all things, when a new heaven and new earth uh, had taken the place of our present heaven and present earth. Isaiah 66, verses 22 through 23. They also maintain that the third reason that you must keep Saturday as the Sabbath is because Christ observed the Sabbath. This day was kept by Him, and because of that, it should be observed by us. He taught that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath in Mark chapter 2 and verse 27. To prove that the Ten Commandments were still in force, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. And whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments shall and shall teach men, so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 17 through 19. Then the fourth reason that they use uh, is uh, that the Sabbath was changed to Sunday. As pagan converts uh, came into the Christian church, 
They say that they brought their pagan customs with them of observing days and months and times and years, and they use Galatians 4 and verse 10. And then after the apostles died, the new converts uh, from paganism remodeled the faith and discontinued honoring the Sabbath. So Seventh-day Adventists uh, teach and believe that uh, the observance of any other day than the Seventh as a Sabbath is actually a sign of the predicted apostasy of the church in which the man of sin would be revealed and uh, would exalt himself above all that is called God and he would be worshipped. Now teaching the observance of the true Sabbath in this generation is their part of the gospel work toward preparing the people are a people for the coming of the Lord. Now every sincere Christian wants to know the truth about this matter. No one would ever want to be guilty of dishonoring a day that God has made holy. And in order for you and I to determine whether this doctrine is true or whether it is false, then we first of all must always go back to the final authority, which is not man's authority, but God's authority, and that's His Word. The first mention of the word Sabbath is given in Exodus chapter 16 and verse 23. It was there that Moses was told the people to gather twice as much bread on the sixth day so that they could rest upon the Sabbath day. You know the story well that the people did not follow his teaching at first and they would gather uh, uh, just enough for that day and then they would go out together on the Sabbath day but there was nothing there. And Moses rebuked them because of this and he said, How long do you refuse to keep the commandments and the laws? See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, and let no man go out of it this place or his place on the seventh day. So the people finally succumbed and rested on that seventh day. Exodus chapter 16, verses 27 through 30 bears to us. Now, it's undoubtedly the Israelites were really not accustomed to this practice of observing the Sabbath day and had never observed such a day before this time. There's no reference, uh, reference of it in Genesis concerning Adam. There's no reference of it in Noah, Abraham, Isaac, or even Jacob honoring the seventh day. It seems very probable that the account uh, in Exodus chapter 16 was the first anyone had ever heard of such. It must be remembered that Noah was, uh, uh, that Moses actually wrote the book of Genesis and that before his day, no one had ever read the scriptures of God resting on the seventh day of his creation. So they were not aware of this. Why was the Sabbath observed by the Israelites? Moses explained it very well when he said, Remember that thou was a servant. Remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt. That's what the scripture says. Shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day rested and was refreshed. Moses said in Exodus chapter 31, verses 16 and 17. This special day was to be observed only by the nation of Israel. It was a part of the old covenant between God and Israel. Ezekiel verified this fact that the Sabbath was a sign between God and Israel when he said in Ezekiel 20 and verse 12, Moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them. 
that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifieth them. He also reiterated this in chapter 20 of Ezekiel, verses 13 through 21. The purpose of keeping the Sabbath was really for the Israelites to commemorate the deliverance from slavery and Egyptian bondage where they had no rest. The only Gentiles that kept this day were those that came out of Egypt with the Israelites and became a part of of the nation of Israel. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 49 bears this out. And then again in Numbers chapter 15 verses 15 and 16. Christ really fulfilled the law. Jesus said that he came not to destroy the law but to fulfill it. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. The Greek word for fulfill is pleru which means to finish, to end, to make complete, to cause to expire. This is exactly what Jesus did to the law. After it was fulfilled, he caused it to cease being in force. The law was not was only a shadow of things that was to come, and Christ was a fulfillment of it. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, Paul said to bring us unto Christ, to lead us there, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, after that we have received that faith, we are no longer under the schoolmaster, which is the law. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, Verses 24 through 26. Now, not being under the law is explained that we are released from its authority. Just like a high school graduate, when he comes out of high school, he is released from the authority of that school. He is no longer under the subjection. He no longer has a certain amount of work to do every day. He no longer has a certain amount of requirements uh, that he has to fulfill. The law has no claim nor authority over those who are under the new covenant now that Christ has fulfilled it or caused it to expire. The old covenant God made with Israel, which was the law of Moses, was insufficient to fulfill all righteousness. In fact, it was called the yoke of bondage, Galatians 5 and 1. And the law of the flesh, uh, Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. And which the new converts, uh, why a new convert is referred as the law of liberty. You, once God fills you with the Holy Ghost and you're baptized in Jesus' name, you are no longer under the yoke of bondage, but now you are in the law of liberty. James chapter 1, verses 18 through 25 as well as the law of the Spirit. Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. Paul wrote, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, that is the first covenant, he said, Behold, the days come, and saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. What was he saying? He was saying that the old covenant was really not sufficient. And I've got to make a new covenant with them. And I'm going to make it with the house of Israel and with the house of Judas. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws no longer on tablets of stone, but I will put my laws into their mind. And I will write these laws within their heart. See, it's a lot different. In that he saith, the new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away or expire. And this is what Paul declared in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 through 10, verse 13. The better covenant that you read about in Hebrews, and 
He said he uses that word very extensively throughout the, the book of Hebrews. He wanted us to know how much better it is now than what it was then. Why? Because uh, always before the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer for the unclean merely rolled our sins ahead of year, but now because of this better covenant, our sins can be blotted out once and for all. Isn't that great? Praise God. It can be blotted out once and for all. The covenant that God made with Abraham required the sign of circumcision of the flesh. But this new covenant abolishes this sign and requires an inward circumcision of the heart. Now, if the law and the Ten Commandments had been fulfilled and abolished, would this mean that a Christian can kill, steal, commit adultery, covet, lie, take the name of the Lord in vain, and on and on? Absolutely not. We are obligated to keep all of these commandments because they were brought into the new covenant. As a matter of fact, Jesus and the apostles brought in the commandments so that they involve actually much more than the original ones. In fact, Jesus said about one of them, uh, speaking of adultery, he said, uh, you know, the law says this. But I say, if you look on them and lust after them to the point uh, that you're thinking about that all the time, he said, you've always done it already in the heart. Because he's no longer dealing with just outward expressions of sin, but he's talking about inward expressions also. Nine of the commandments were put in force in the new contract or the new covenant. Only the fourth is nowhere to be found. Only the fourth. Number one, the first uh, commandment was, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He reiterated that or put it into force in the new covenant in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 38, and 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. The second commandment was, Thou shalt not make any graven image. Paul spoke about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verses 10 and 11. And chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. The third commandment was, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Paul again spoke about this in Romans chapter 2 and verse 24. And Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8. He also spoke about, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But you know that's not mentioned one time in the New Testament. Or under the new covenant. Not one scripture is to be found. What about the fifth commandment? Honor thy father and thy mother, that thou days, thy days may be long on the earth. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, and Colossians chapter 3, verse 20. Thou shalt not kill, was again reiterated in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 22, and Romans chapter 13. Verse 9, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20. Uh, or 1 John chapter 3 and verse 15, pardon me. Thou shalt not commit adultery, the seventh commandment. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 28. It was reiterated in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19 through 21. Then thou shalt not steal was Paul spoke of in Romans chapter 2, verse 21, and Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28. Thou shalt not bear false witness or lie. Romans chapter 13 and verse 9, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 21. And then number 10 was thou shalt not covet. And it was again reiterated in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. Why did not Jesus or the apostles command men to keep the Sabbath? The reason was because it was the only one that was a sign of the old covenant between God and Israel and it was there merely to commemorate their deliverance from Egypt. 
It was also a type or shadow of the rest that was to come with Christ, or when Christ came. For which we have believed do in which uh, we which have believed do enter into rest. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this was, and God did rest on the seventh day from all of his works. There remaineth therefore rest to the people of God. For he that entereth into his rest, he hath also ceased from his own works, as God did from his. What was he talking about in Hebrews 4, chapter 4, verses 3 through 10? He was talking about uh, we cease from the works of this flesh. We cease from living in sin, and we enter into the rest of the Holy Ghost. There would be no need to make the Jewish Sabbath a part of the new covenant. For the new covenant concerns nations who were never delivered from Egypt. The Sabbath under the new covenant would require another purpose from that which the Israelites' covenant was first instituted, even if the Sabbath was intended to be a memorial of the deliverance from Egypt, that creation was cursed, uh, uh, it, to be a memorial of the original creation. Instead of a deliverance from Egypt, it would still not be observed because that nation or that creation was cursed by God and sin. It would only be proper that it be abolished completely uh, and the new Sabbath to be instituted as a memorial of the new creation in Christ. The fourth commandment is the only one of the ten that was a ceremonial law. The rest were not a ceremonial law. It was the only one that could be broken without violating a moral law. All of the others lost had to do with relationships and obligations of men to God and man to man. And Paul was summing all of this up under the new covenant. After naming several of them, he adds, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Romans chapter 13, verses 7 through 10. Once again, the fourth commandment was completely ignored or left out. It was as important as some teach it to be Surely it would have been listed by Paul with the other commandments at least one time under the new covenant, but not one time was it ever listed. The prophets of old had foretold that the Sabbath would be abolished because of Israel's hypocrisy in keeping this day. That was to be a sign between God and Israel. I will cause all of her mirth to cease, all of her laughter. I will cause her feast days, her... Her new moons and her Sabbaths and all of her solemn feasts. I'm going to cause it all to cease. God said, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with this. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons, your appointed feasts, my soul hated. God spoke through Isaiah chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. He was saying, I'm going to do away with all of it, including your Sabbath, because... You, uh, you've held it to a point where it's so ceremonious that I, uh, it's become a stench in my nostrils and I hate it. It was also predicted that God would make a new covenant with Israel when the Messiah would come and to earth and set up His kingdom. Isaiah 42, 6 and Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 34. Though Israel as a whole did not accept the Messiah, the covenant was still made and it's still in force today. How did the apostles actually feel about the Gentile Christians obeying the law of Moses? When certain Pharisees came uh, that had been filled with the Holy Ghost and, and baptized in Jesus' name, they thought it was needful that the Gentiles be circumcised. And it, they thought it was needful for them to keep the law of Moses. Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Acts chapter 15, 
verses 5 and 10. After all of the discussion, all of the debates, it ended. You know what it was decided? James stood up. He said, it's good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay no greater burden upon you than necessary things, that ye abstain from meats that are offered to idols, that you abstain from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves ye do well. Acts chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Not one word was mentioned about keeping the Sabbath or the law of Moses. When Jewish brethren tried to teach the, the Gentile Christian in Galatians that they had to keep the law, Paul wrote this, After that ye had known God, or rather yet that ye are known of God, how can ye turn again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? Galatians 4, 9 through 31. He went on to tell them the story of the two sons of Abraham, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. And then he said, the Gal You Galatians, you are not born of the bondwoman. You're not children of the bondwoman. You're children of the free. Why then would they wish, or why then should you wish to be under bondage? And then he went on to say, Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with that yoke of bondage. Galatians 5 and verse 1. While he wrote to the church at Colossae, he instructed them, he said, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of an holy day or a new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are shadow, merely shadows of things that are to come. Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17. He wrote to the Romans church, and he said, There one man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regarded the day, regard it as unto the Lord. If you don't regard the day, do it as unto the Lord anyhow. Romans chapter 14, verses 5 and 6. Strong statements were made by this great apostle to the Gentiles to actually discourage them from keeping the Sabbath day. The early Christians always gathered for worship, actually, on the first day of the week. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay it by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. 1 Corinthians 16, and verse 2. John even said... Uh, he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, Revelation 1 and verse 10. When the book of Revelation was written, what really is the Lord's Day? Was it the Sabbath day? Not necessarily. The International uh, Bible Encyclopedia, Standard Bible, volume 3, pages uh, 1919 and 1920, had this to say. Lord's Day in the New Testament occurs only in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, but in the post-apostolic, or the, uh, after the apostles were dead, the, uh, the literature that was written after they were dead, there was the references where in the epistle of Ignatius to the Magnesians in chapter 9, book 9 and verse 1, or chapter 9 and verse 1, he said, No longer keeping the Sabbath, but living according to the Lord's day on which our light arose. That the observance of the, of the Sabbath on Saturday ended during the time of the apostles and a new Christian worship was instituted on Sunday, the first day of the week. Scores of books were written in the first 200 years of the church age and they all established this same fact. 
if this change to Sunday had begun after the time of the apostles and they had taught contrary or taught that, that you must not keep any other day but the Sabbath day or Saturday, then all Christianity ought to revert back to keeping the old law on the Sabbath day. But that was not the case. In fact, there's very positive evidence that to prove that this custom began actually during the lifetime